I've always been a Baptist all, all my life, yeah, yeah. My mother was a Congregationalist. She married a Baptist. I was the eldest of three children, I was only six at the time. And I remember distinctly remember my mother asking us, the three of us as a group, which Sunday school would we prefer to go to, either to the Baptist one in Ruthin or to the Congregational one, the Annie Bunwir. And we said in deference to my f well, father, we decided to become Baptist. It's not so bad for me because I've, we, I've only been a member here when we moved to the area in 1985 because we were uh, regular worshippers in other places. We, it was natural that we should, should come here. This is our nearest Baptist chapel. Technically, the lease was surrendered on, surrendered on the 24th of June 2013. The first day of the insurance year and so we paid the insurance up until the last day. The Mostyn were very kind, with it, were very good to us. They allowed us to sort of use the building after that day, not use it, but if any, any member wanted to come in and collect some particular artifacts. Many ladies took, the, took a, a cup, a tabernacle cup and saucer home with them, just as a sort of memento. And if anybody had any books or hymn books belonging to the families and that sort of thing, they and any bits of photographs to one or two took over. To, to so, so, so the artefacts are, are being distributed? Well, some of the artefacts, but the, the, the main ones, and in particular the legal documents, which we kept in the safe in the church here, have gone back to the uh, archives department of Conway County Council. And then the, and some of the objects there in the museum? I think. Some of the objects are in the museum as well, yeah. And, what, and the robes, I think. Are yeah, the... the the, la the ladies' baptism robes. They're quite interesting, actually, because in the hem of the robes, uh, there are pieces of lead, so they don't rise up when they en enter the water. The iconic figure within the history of Tabernacle is, is Valentine. He came, he was appointed um, here after he finished his course. He, he had a very torrid time uh, as a medical orderly in the First World War and became, he was a staunch pacifist. And he came out of the army and finished his degree course in Bangui University. Before he actually finished his course, his, uh, the, he'd been offered the job here. And he finished the course and he was involved with this bombing at the bombing school at Penaberth, uh, Pen Pen isn't it, in, uh, near Pothelli. He, uh, he was sent to prison and in fact, because he and the other two people involved, they were the founder members of what we know today as the Welsh Nationalist Party. There is talk, and I haven't seen it recorded anywhere, but about eight or nine families left the church while he was in prison and um, enrolled in a Presbyterian church. And to make matters worse, not only did they become Presbyterians, but they became English Presbyterians. And I can recall when we first moved here in 1985, we used to have coffee mornings here and ladies used to come and used to support us in the coffee morning. And they remembered, they were members of the English Presbyterian Church and they remembered coming here to Sunday school and which corner they, they sat because they were sat or which, which corner of the building they, they, they occupied um, when there were children in Sunday school here. And it's said that when he finished his prison sentence, the, de the diaconate here gave him a month's break holiday for him to sort of recover and get his feet under it. The church was so full, they actually scoured the cafes around Upper Mostyn Street here to provide extra chairs to put down, down both down the aisles. What health and safety would say about it these days, you know, uh, for, well, you know it doesn't bear thinking about. First of all, the candidates were sort of given, if you like, a course and made sure the minister probably took them aside maybe two or three weeks, maybe three months beforehand to sort of um, in, make sure that they understood the, what they were committing themselves to. They would be baptised on a, probably on a Sunday morning. The whole congregation would be pretty full because it was an event. You probably went to Sunday school that afternoon, but the Sunday evening they had a communion service and you sat in the front 
of the congregation and the minister actually uh, would be would, would would give you the bread and the wine himself, not just deacons, the minister, because you would honoured people, and that was the only time <laughs> you'd get them get the the uh, sacrament directly from from the minister. When you're baptising a group of people, what they tend to do is baptise the smallest person first, because as they go through the water, the level of the water decreases because the person being baptised carries water away on their clothing and so on. So if you did the big people first, by the time you got to the smaller people, there wouldn't be that much water left, you see. I believe it was somewhere in the 90s. And funnily enough, it was a, a young, two teenagers, a boy and a girl, and they were Presbyterians. And we loaned the baptistry, if you like, to the English Presbyterian Church, and they baptised these two young people okay. one Sunday afternoon. Right. They were members of their congregation and a few of us, of us around as well, you know. But, uh... so, I mean, I, I remember distinctly stepping into the pool um, and, you know, thinking, this is a big moment, um, and then coming out and feeling, um, you know, as you should do, this is a new beginning. This yes. is, it was definitely a spiritual experience. And a... So I was guided into the baptism pool in this direction mm -hmm. and I arrived in the, at the bottom of the pool um, and Park Idwell Jones uh, delivered uh, the baptism from here. I was fully clothed, um, so I came in a suit, took my jacket off, signed the register, in we came uh, for the baptism. And then it was quite a shock really. I, d I don't know if I had a sort of a momentary lapse of concentration, but all of a sudden I was yeah, can I just brought go? backwards oh, okay. under the water yeah. and um, apparently my wife and my brother and family were in the congregation and as, as my head came up apparently I was just this you know, comedy uh, sight and this is the route in which I uh, took to come out of the baptism pool from memory one of the deacons yeah. uh, would guide you in there and come in with you and give you towels etc and it had a change of clothes um, right. in that ante room yeah. Uh, in order to uh, get ready and come back out to the congregation. It's a memorable day. We had, I mean, I had family here from the Wirral in England, um, and I had family from Clangothlan that had travelled over, and then other family in, uh, in, who were from the town uh, who came along as well, cousins, uh, etc. So it was really nice to bring everybody together. The fact that I had family here from England, uh, and Park Edwell Jones delivered um, the sermon in English and Welsh, which was rare um, for, uh, for this tabernacle, uh, made it all the more um, sort of momentous, if you like. And I think, um, apparently I was the last person to be baptised here as well, uh, which is, from my <laughs> perspective is a, is a great honour, because mm. it's such an amazing uh, building. And my family's had this uh, tradition with the building uh, which stretches in excess of 120 years. My four times great-grandfather, Richard Hughes, um, was deacon here, and he was a treasurer um, as well. Um, he used to keep the, the chapel's money um, behind the hearth, behind the grate um, in his house in Maddox Street. Um, and um, they were very much, the, the Hugheses and the Jones family, uh, which he married into from Prutlgwickiad Farm, uh, were very much involved um, in, the, uh, in the tabernacle. And Richard had eight children, they were all baptised here. I know that many of his great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren were. And that's why originally when I wrote to the tabernacle um, and they put me in touch with the then treasurer, Elena Jones, um, who ends up being a, a distant cousin of mine as well, because uh, Richard Hughes was her great-great-grandfather. Um, that's why I arranged to come here and, and be baptised here, because so many generations had, uh, before me had, had done that. I thought before I got married in, uh, in the mid-90s, it would be a nice thing to do. Yeah, the organ, um, there is a little plaque on there, which notes that it was transferred from the Congregational Church, just maybe 100 yards up the road here, to here, because they had a big, 1902, a lot of things were happening in London. Um, the background for the, the Congregational Church up there, Christ Church, uh, it was 
the, ch the chapel used by the Welsh Congregationalists, the Annie Bunwyr. But because of the influx of the railways, particularly into Llandidno, very many more English uh, congregational people moved to Llandidno and they found themselves with two congregations in the same church, the Welsh one and the English one. And they used to try and hold... Uh, neither congregation would change the times of their services. And they used to try and hold... They used to try and worship in the church on the, on the top level, perhaps the Welsh congregation, and the English congregation underneath, in the sort of schoolroom underneath. And you had a situation where maybe one congregation wanted quiet, perhaps for prayer or for a sermon, while the, the other congregation was singing at the tops of their voices, you see. So this couldn't continue. So the, a benevolent member of the Welsh congregation gave them land in now the Ganwy Avenue and they built the Welsh congregational ch church there. The Welsh congregation moved out into a new chapel in the Ganwy Avenue. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when the congregation moved out about 1902, the extension was being built there. The organ became available and a bit, a, a person, I think, a member from this church actually bought the organ and gave it. But the organ is much earlier than 1902. I've heard it said that it's one of the oldest organs in any chapel in Wales. If you look at the numbers on the side of the pews, you can see that two or three pews may have been taken away from here to accommodate the organ. Because of course the pulpit may well have been where the organ is now. Surely it was, so then they, they, they had to push they it push, out. Push it out, yeah. There's no record of people buying their own seats here. Because the giveaway, you know, some churches, um, if you look at the side of the pews, there's like a little holder to hold a label where your name goes in, and that was your pew, all right? Not present here at all. The older generation used to occupy the ground floor, and the second generation after them would be upstairs. And I know one of the ladies who, she's still alive, but she, alas, she's at an advanced stage of um, Alzheimer's now. She used to tell me that her mother and father sat down here, and then she used to go and sit with them. She wouldn't sit with her parents because she was afraid of sitting on the shelf. She was afraid she might fall, a child, you know, might fall, fall, fall into the congregation. There's a sign on the other side, yeah, dis distour with, you know. Um, I'm not sure about the window at all. And, and what, why distour with? They're not, as well, because, you see, uh, the congregation might be in here, if you like, prior to the service, and people would be chatting, right, before the service. And, you know, it's just, it was annoying. So yeah. I suppose they put this sign up. Okay, and so that looks would, like the original as well, yes, you know. So people would come here just, just to contemplate and it's to got, be quiet. And, yeah, yeah. Of course, so then people were like gossiping. Or gossiping, something. yeah. Um, we used to struggle to change these, these on the perimeter, these big ones. But the one in the middle, we used to have to crawl through that trap door in the far corner up there and then crawl along the roof space to the, where the light is just above us. Yeah. And you have to have a second person standing in the pulpit with the new bulb. The person in the roof space would lower the light. The chap in the pulpit would change the bulbs and lift it back up again. <laughs> Which job did you have, the, the bulb holder or the crawler? And I haven't been a crawler. <laughs> I, I sort of... this time, you could do it. <laughs> yeah. But we, we, it, it was quite a struggle, actually. You need a good head for heights Definitely. to actually change the other ones, you know, around the outside. We used to put a set of steps right close to the edge of the gallery here. Right, right. Oh, it's very difficult. How does it feel now, going back, knowing that it's, that's it? I mean, that's, that, the doors are closed. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very sad. I've got five children, um, and it would have been nice to have thought that as they got older um, and they were ready, then they could have been um, baptised here um, as well. It's like a magnet, it sort of brings us back all the time and always has done. Um, and I bring the children here and we always drive past Tabernacle uh, and I always point out where I was baptised and the mother always giggles when she remembers my face coming out of the baptism pool. So you kind of, you know, you, re you feel connected to the building because of that? Yes, you, absolutely, you know. yeah, massively connected. And I hope 
one way or another, I hope it stays um, and has some sort of function. Something that, where it really gives something back to the people that Land did now, um, because this was so well attended. As you can imagine, um, the buzz in here on a Sunday um, in the sort of the, the late 1800s when there's, uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of people here. Um, and it was built for that purpose. If you think of when it was originally built, um, we didn't have the same amount of um, sort of leisure activities that we have today. On a Sunday, this was people's lives and the room next door and the Sunday school and this was what it was all about outside of work, really. So I think to give something back um, to the community um, which was involved in the arts or leisure, I think would be, um, would probably be the most appropriate.